So in several of my recent videos, we've been shooting light bullets in 223 using a slow twist, one in 14 twist bolt action rifle. And we're gonna continue that today with some more work on the 40 grain Hornady VMAX. So here's the load data for today. I, I basically just wanna explore Vitavori N133 a little bit more. We shot a couple groups in the last video with this powder, and one of the groups was really good. 24.5 grains gave us this 0.42 inch group. So I wanna reload that charge and see what happens. But then I also wanna jump up a little bit higher than we were before. In the last video, we topped off at 25.0 grains. No sign of pressure. The velocities are high, but like I double checked the Vitavori load data, which goes up, it shows a max charge of 25.9 with velocities around 3,700 feet per second. So I'm feeling pretty good about moving up. We'll shoot uh, two tenths of a grain increments starting at 25.2 and working up to 25.8. All of the other components are the same as the last video. Overall length is gonna be 2.3 inches, Lake City Brass and Federal GM205M primers. So I also want to do some sizing die testing today. So with the 50 pieces of brass that I've fire formed in this gun, I wanna resize half of them with the Lee Collet die. I wanna resize the other half with the Mighty Armory full length die. I don't expect that we'll see much difference. And I'll just wait till the end of the video whenever we've got some results to analyze before I talk much more on the subject. I found something really strange that I wanna show you when I was getting this brass ready for this video. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So this group of 25 on the right, are the ones we used in the first and second video with this gun. Now in the first video, we shot the 53 grain Hornady match with a couple of my grandfather's old favorite loads. They were full power, full velocity loads. So that's how they were initially fire formed. In the next video, I used the Lee Collet die just to size the neck. And then we loaded this brass with the 40 grain V max with some other powders, H335. Uh, what else did we shoot? Yeah, it was either H335 or Alliant Power Pro Varmint. So these have never been full length resized. They've never had the shoulder bumped. So if we take this tool, the Hornady Headspace Comparator with the, the 330 insert. Okay, let's zero it there. Then we just slide it in. Get it aligned. And I've got 1.466. Now you would expect that any piece of this that we grab should be the same. That one's the same. Try another one. That one's the same. Let's try another one. That one's just a little bit shorter. 1465. Here's the next one. 1466. Okay, so this twice fired brass that's definitely well fire formed is 1.466. So let's zero it there. And let me put all these back so I don't lose them. Okay, let's move to the next tray. And let's grab a piece here. This first one is four thousandths of an inch shorter. Let's try another one. That one's about one and a half thousand shorter. Let's try another one. The next one's two and a half thousand short. So all of these are shorter than I expected them to be. So here's one that's four thousand short. So these did not fully fire form. And the number is not consistent, right? I mean, just in these first couple pieces that we've looked at, we've had from four thousandths to what was one and one, one and a half thousandths. Let's grab another one. There's one that's three. So th this, this three rows that I've been pulling out of so far are the rounds we shot with Vitavori N120 in the last video. So these two rows were with Vitavori N133, which is what we're shooting today. Here's the first one of these. That is 12 thousandths short. That is huge. Let's go to the next one. The next one is 12. Let's try the next one. 10 and a half. Next one, four and a half. So, so this has been very surprising to see. I didn't expect it because these were all, you know, full power loads between, you know, 3,300 and 3,600 feet per second. So I found this really interesting. If we go back to these, which, right, these are the ones that we fired twice. These are very, very consistent. They all come out exactly the same or, you know, within a thousandth of an inch. So I was curious, how does this chamber compare to like my AR-15 chamber. So here's a couple pieces of brass that were fired in that gun. That's three and a half thousand shorter. And the next one's the same, three and a half thousand shorter. So back to the tray of the ones that aren't quite fully fire formed, I thought it was interesting that the Vitavori N120 brass, which was lower velocity, 
fire form better than the, than the Vitavori N133 at the higher velocity. I don't know that I would call it surprising, but it was interesting. I believe we were, you know, we were shooting higher pressures with the faster powder at those lower velocities, just kind of an ob observation. So these are the two sizing dies for today. The Lee Collet neck sizing die, which once you take it apart, what it's doing, what it's doing is putting this mandrel inside of the neck. Why isn't my camera focusing today? It wants to be stupid. Yeah, so the neck, neck of the case is brought up over this mandrel, which right now you can tell Neck's certainly a little bit bigger than the mandrel. So this is going to go up inside of this collet like that. And this is gonna pinch down and basically just squeeze the brass around the mandrel to size it. Pretty cool. So at the very least, like my last video where I was shooting some new brass, it was nice to use for that to make sure the necks were round and sized properly without needing any lubrication whatsoever. Now I haven't used these dies much, and so far the, the difficult part is getting it set in the press properly so that you're, you know, you're closing the collet enough and getting a consistent size. So gonna, gonna play around with that a little bit today. And the other die is this Mighty Armory 223 Folding Sizing die. I really love this die. It's so well made. Just all of the, the little stuff like that knurling is just so nicely done. And the finish is amazing and the inside is like polished. So the die's just been silky smooth since I got it. If I could get the right angle, there's a little taper right down in there that the expander sits in. So that's how the, the expander is centered and located inside of the die. So that little part right there is what's actually sizing our neck. So I've just got this basic tip in there right now. You can also run a decapping pin in here to decap the brass. So a really cool expanding and decapping assembly. Even little stuff like, like putting flats on there, which would make loosening a difficult decapping pin. I've run into that in a lot of designs where you're trying to get the decapping pin out for replacement and you feel like there's no safe place to get a grip on it. That's pretty neat. So pretty standard fulling sizing die, just done really, really well. So this is the main 223 resizing die that I've been using now for quite some time. So here's the question. I, I need 25 pieces of brass for each of the dies. So which one gets which? So I think the way I'm gonna do it, the full length resizing die is gonna go with the brass that is fully fire formed. We've got consistent headspace numbers across the whole batch and we should be able to bump the shoulder, probably just barely, one or two thousandths and get consistently full length resized brass. Because if you think about the nightmare of this batch, which has varying and inconsistent headspace measurements, like what would you set your die off of? None of this brass is fully fire formed, so bumping the shoulder at all would be oversizing the brass. So that's why that one is getting the next sizing die. So how does this affect our evaluation today? I mean, I guess all of the troubles are over here, right? This is, this is perfectly fire formed brass that we should be able to do exactly what we want to. And over here with our next sized brass, let's say it doesn't shoot well today, we'll have inconsistent headspace as an excuse, along with the big factor to keep in mind, which is neck tension differences between the two expander balls, or the mandrel in here, which is setting the diameter, and the expander in this one that is setting the, the neck diameter. So we'll try to measure the neck tension differences, but not much we can really do here about headspace. I think this doesn't matter at all. I don't think it's a big deal. As far as accuracy goes, we've had good luck with the brand new brass that isn't even fire formed. But I noticed it, it's interesting, so I thought I would try my best to explain it. So I guess this is step one, let's, let's size this brass. So just in case this collet isn't making any sense, let's look at the, the Lee factory crimp die for 223. So looking down into the top of this die, you'll see it has a collet very similar to the next sizing die. So if I screw this down a little ways and then raise the ram, you see the collet closes. That's the exact same thing that's going on inside of the next sizing die, we just can't see it. Now you can clearly feel whenever the collet gets completely closed. And there's, there's a very distinct point where you feel that it's done. So here in this picture, I can show you that it's done in this crimp die but in the next sizing die, a lot of this is gonna be going off a of feel. 
So that's too far, and that's about the maximum we can get. And then, of course, we can adjust down from there to where the collet only closes a little. So I am using the RCBS Rebel today. It's a big, strong press with lots of leverage, and when the ram comes up, it's a dead stop. Like, the ram goes up all the way. If I was using my Hornady Lock and Load Classic Press, which is a cam over press, they actually warn you in the instructions with the, with the Lee collet die that you gotta be more careful because the ram on that press, whenever it's coming up, right at the top of the stroke, it comes up and then at the last little second, it cams over and comes back down. So with that press like this, if you just raise the ram and let it rest there and then screw your die down, You'll run into problems if you're, if you're not accounting for that little bit of upward movement that the ram's going to have whenever you begin the downstroke. That's a little bit confusing, I'm sure, but it, it was in the manual for the die, so I figured I'd mention it. So just like with that factory crimp die, what I want to do now is just kind of probe around and see if I can find the bottom where I can feel that the collet is closing. Yep, like right there. I've actually gone quite a bit too far. Okay, I think that's it. I'd like to find some way to mark the die, you know, so I can keep track of what I'm doing. But the adjustments are so minute, I'm not sure I can. I'm gonna grab a Sharpie and try anyway. Okay, maybe that'll be useful, but it might not. So, I've got some brass that I've just had laying around that's been, that's been cleaned up, but it hasn't been resized. It's fired in a different gun, but should be perfectly good to take a couple of initial measurements. This is also Lake City brass, just like we're shooting today. Okay, with the brass in there, it is not wanting to go. Like I'm, I'm putting more pressure than I would like. So I'm gonna slowly back out on this piece of brass until I can get the, the ram to raise fully. Yeah, I was way off. Or I shouldn't say I was off, it's just the situation seemed to change a lot more once I've got a piece of brass into the, into the equation. Okay, I got it up in there. That's, that's like a quarter of a turn from where I was. I'm gonna go ahead and do two pieces at this setting. So here's the second one. Goes down in there, like you can feel that you're doing a bit of work. Try and mark that spot, roughly. Try and go just a little bit farther and double check, make sure. So I, this shouldn't go in, or it would probably go in if I really, really gave it the business, but yeah, yeah, too tight. Good, so I found my max. So now I'm gonna back off just a little bit, like maybe a 30 second of a turn, and this should be a bit easier, not much. I'm gonna go out just a little bit farther much easier there. I think if I go any farther, yeah, we'll try that. Okay, that, that's really light. Okay, so the Sharpie mark on the lock ring doesn't count, but see, I've got a mark there and then I've got a mark down here. So that's where I was with minimum sizing and then around this way to this piece, and then around this way to this mark was the maximum. So about an eighth of a turn of the die is what we're investigating right now. I've got this little gauge from Ballistic Tools, it's supposed to be a neck gauge. You see a couple different uh, flat spots there. They are 224, 221, and so on. So a piece that hasn't been sized should go all the way down and onto the last flat. And with sized brass, this first one is the one we sized the least. Oh, that is clearly not enough. Let's try the other piece that I sized at that setting. Yep, that ain't gonna do it, folks. Yeah, least sized, most sized. Let's just switch over to the, the one I sized the heaviest. And it doesn't want to go down on there. There's no friction whatsoever. Let's see, what was that band? Yeah, the 221 band. So it's going over the 221 band with like no, no resistance, no friction. So that is three thousandths under bullet diameter. Okay. 
should probably try the other piece of brass that was sized that same way. And it feels the same. Move down to this one. It feels similar, maybe a little bit looser. I'm not sure if it's all in my head. Let's try the, let's try the next row real quick. Yep, that one went down right over top of it. So back to this one, just to, to feel. Yeah, that's definitely tighter than the next one over, which stops at the same spot, but it's just looser. There's more, yeah, it's just looser. So it seems to me that screwing the die in as far as I feel comfortable doing it is what I want to do. There might also be, you know, maybe I didn't go tight enough. Like the part where I had the die screwed in a little bit farther, but it just felt like I was putting too much pressure on it. Maybe that is normal. Maybe that's okay. Because if we consult the instructions for this die, in the instructions, it comes down to, at this point, the lever must be pushed firmly, minimum 25 pounds, to close the collet and size the neck. Extra bullet grip can be obtained by screwing the die in an additional quarter turn. And then in a section called tighter bullet fit, they talk about how you can polish the mandrel 1,000 smaller or contact them to get an undersized collet or a mandrel. So not really, not really getting much insight there. Okay, so back to the adjustment. So there's our minimum. I'm blocking the light. You can't see anything. Yeah, down here's my mark. There's my die mark. So that's minimum sizing. This is maximum or what, what worked for us. I'm gonna go just a little bit more and try again. Okay, that wasn't so bad. I wanna go a little bit more. Yeah, that, that was a ton of pressure. That's, that's more than I, I'm gonna break something. So here's that first one that was a little bit tighter. And here's the, the next one that was much tighter. Yeah, these don't seem to be much different from one another. So forgetting about the gauge for a minute, I wanna see if I can just measure outside neck diameter. Let's go and see if I can measure the outside of the neck and get a consistent number. Okay, so here's the piece that we sized the least is right about 250. Here's the other piece that was sized with that setting. The next setting was a little bit smaller, 247, so definitely big difference between those two. Here's the next setting, 245. And it seems to have plateaued at 245. Like these last couple that we sized the most doesn't seem to be making much difference. Okay, that was extremely confusing, I bet. I basically tested five different die settings, the least amount of sizing, and then the next one up from that. Those are the ones that definitely didn't get sized enough and they go right down over our gauge. But the next three are pretty close to one another. So we seem to have hit the point where we're fully sizing that neck onto the mandrel and minor adjustments aren't make, making much difference. So I'm gonna come back to my die. This is the, the mark that worked well. I'm gonna go just a little bit past it and go ahead and lock down the die. Okay, so all of this extra brass, I'm gonna go ahead and run it through. I need to load up some extra pieces for ciders. So I might as well, and this is another thing I guess I need to decide is, am I going to spin the cases and size twice because in the manual it does say, I think they say for the best accuracy. There we go, here's our option. Even greater accuracy can be obtained by rotating the case one half turn and sizing the case a second time. I think we'll go ahead and do that. I'm not in a big hurry. I've got a couple extra minutes. It just dawned on me, I better go double check, make sure this stuff will fit in the gun. Already established earlier, my AR has shorter headspace, so it shouldn't be a, a headspace clearance problem, but this gun's chamber could be, you know, skinnier in the body or something. So I better go check.
Well, that brass is not fitting in the gun, which is okay because because I'm about to set up a full length sizing die, we'll go ahead and full length size our cider brass for the day. Because did I mention earlier, I did clean the barrel in this gun really well. So having a couple fouling shots to shoot is pretty important, I think. But for the time being, I'm gonna go ahead and run our 25 pieces through this die. This brass has been tumbled just briefly. I gave them like a 20 minute tumble and then I annealed them uh, with the annealies. So decapped, cleaned, and annealed. Now I really should have gone through this process back in the first video where I used this die because I'm definitely sizing them harder than I was. Because in, in bullet seating in those videos, I was definitely, it didn't feel like I had a ton of neck tension. Bullet seating was going a little smoother than it probably should, but it didn't really matter too much because, you know, I'm single, single feeding a bolt action rifle. It's not that critical like it is in a semi-auto. So I'll, I'll be very interested to see how these feel whenever we get to bullet seating. Okay, that's it for the, for the Lee Collet die. And I had a little change of plan on my ciders. I found 20 pieces of brass that somewhere in the past, I prepped it all the way and even primed it, and it fits in the gun. So we're just gonna go with that. Shoot those. I, I don't even remember where they came from. Sometimes it's nice to have brass laying around that's prepped and ready to go, but the majority of the time it's just confusing. That could be remedied with better note taking or labeling and that sort of stuff, but that seems like a lot of work. Okay, so the goal here is to set this up so it's bumping our shoulder maybe a thousandth of an inch. I'll tell you what I want to do for this part is remove the, the decapping and expanding. I want to remove that for just a couple minutes. The brass, I did go ahead and spray it with some Hornady One Shot and let it dry. So that's the lube situation. There's our 1.466 headspace. Remember that from earlier. I'm going to zero my calipers there. And we're looking for one or two thousandths after the sizing process. So I've screwed it down just until it's lightly touching. Hopefully that's not too much. Yeah, that's way too much. And I think what happened is my experience kind of bit me because I've used this die quite a bit for my AR brass, but earlier in this video, we already established that this gun has quite a bit more headspace than my AR, right? So we don't need to screw the die down as far to get the shoulder bump we're after. So whenever I was screwing down this die, it's just, it's already in my head that I remember this die, like yeah, right down at about lightly touching is where I wanna be, but not for this gun. It happens and it's not a huge deal. Not gonna freak out about it. Okay, so after my adjustment, my headspace actually grew. You'll see that sometimes whenever you don't have the die down enough to touch the shoulder at all. It'll actually get a little bit longer as the body's resized. So just made a very small adjustment. Let's try it again. Still not touching. One more adjustment. I got it back to zero. I've gone just a little bit too far. Two and a half or three thousandths. I was getting three a second ago. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and back it out just a smidgen. All right, I think I'm finally dialed in. 10 adjustments later. Yep, nailed it. Right at 1,000th. Now let's put the expander back in the die. I just did that to save on brass wear because sometimes you have moments like this where it took me 10 tries to get the setting right where I wanted it. And especially if you're trying to use the same piece of brass over and over as you're setting your die, constantly squeezing the neck down and then opening it back up can be a lot of fatigue on the brass. So even without that in there, I spread like all of my adjustments, you know, I used five different pieces of brass. So first thing I need to run these five back through and they might be a little bit of a pain in the butt to get over the expander. That's okay. It's another thing I really like about this die is the design of that the tapered bottom of that expander sim assembly is really nice. It, you know, if you got a dinged neck or you know, a situation like this where the necks are undersized, it does a pretty good job of, of spreading them out. So 
So the, the three pieces that I bumped the shoulder a little bit too much on, I'm gonna go ahead and mark them. And we'll use all three of them in the first group. That way if we, if we catch a funky flyer or something with one of these, we'll be able to identify it. So I wanna trim this brass and I've been thinking over my options. The easiest would be this little Lee setup where you put the brass in a shell holder, this goes down through the neck, and then this spins to do the cutting. So this first piece doesn't need anything. Let's see how long this actually is. So this Lee, Lee setup's not adjustable, obviously. Makes sense, 1.749. So I think the normal trim length is 1.750 and max is 1.760. So this piece is under the trim length, and it's one of the pieces that isn't fully fire formed. Let's see if they're all that way. Here's the very next piece, 1.757. So this one would get trimmed a little bit. So I don't think I'm gonna use the Lee setup today. I think I'm gonna use my RCBS Trim Pro instead, because what I'm concerned about is like, we're, we're kind of comparing dies, sizing dies, and you know we've already spent all of this time talking about neck tension and the neck tension difference between the two dies might be our biggest factor here, right? So what I'm worried about is, you know, normally I put this in a drill so you can do this pretty quick and then in goes the, the case length gauge. So what happens to the inside surface of the neck while I'm spinning the case over top of that, that gauge, right? You know what I'm saying? Like I'm, I'm just kind of worrying about this affecting the neck, which affects our test. Probably nothing to freak out about. I use these all the time, but it just kind of got in my head today. And I thought, well, I'm just gonna grab my Trim Pro instead because the case snaps in there and then this comes across to, you know, to do the trimming. You can install a pilot that will go into the case mouth during the, the trimming prospect process, but I'm not gonna do that either. So Trim Pro with no pilot, hopefully affects our necks as little as possible. So I've skipped all the boring parts and jumped to the end. I've already got our seating die set up. I used it to seat the bullets on the cider ammunition. So now I've got 10 charges weighed out and I'm ready to seat those bullets. The first five are from the full length sizing die. The second five are the, are the next sizing die. It'll be interesting here to, uh, to feel the difference in seating force. Better double check my overall length. So 2.3 inches is our is our target. Yeah, this first one's 2.302. Just wanted to make sure. Okay, this is the last one with the full length die. They're seating very, very smooth and easy. Let's see if our next size die feels about the same. Hmm. Maybe a little bit easier. Yeah, maybe just a little bit easier. But not by much. Let me take some measurements real quick. Now, the other problem here is with this big, long 2.3 inch overall length. This is much, much longer than the standard book overall length, but this is 15 thousandths off the lands in this rifle. You can see we don't have much contact surface there between our neck and the bearing surface of the bullet. So when I measure the neck with the bullet seated, I'm getting 245. That's what I'm seeing across multiple pieces. Yeah, so I was actually measuring out the numbers and it's pretty close. So with both the full length die and the neck sizing die, I'm getting about 244 whenever I measure the neck before we see the bullet. Yeah, that's, that's the average number I'm seeing. And then with the bullet seated, 
it's 246, but I get a lot of 245 fives. So one and a half to two thousandths of neck tension is look, looks like that's about what we've got with both dies. And I think that just that tiny amount of bullet that we're actually seating into the neck is the reason why, like I'm kind of, I'm feeling very slight differences and it's making me freak out about it a little bit. So, all right, that's pretty much it. Skipped over a lot of the boring stuff. Bullet seating going nice and smooth and looks like we have pretty close to the same neck tension on, on both. So I'm gonna get the rest of these seated. If anything pops up, I'll turn the camera back on, but if not, I'll just see you on the range. Okay, so I'm set up and ready to go. Temperature very high, it's in the mid 90s and the dew point's up in the 70s. So everything I brought out of the house just immediately got covered in condensation. So I've had everything out here for a couple hours to make sure it had plenty of time to get up to ambient temperature. The target's down at 100 yards. This gun is a Remington 700 BDL Varmint Special with a factory barrel from the 70s with a one in 14 twist. It was rechambered from 222 to 223 by my grandfather or the gunsmith my grandfather hired, I should say. It's got an 18 power Nikon scope. We're gonna get our velocities with a lab radar chronograph and we'll be using the shot marker electronic target system to monitor our groups and measure them. I think that covers the frequently asked questions. And I just looked through the scope for the first time since I took my target camera down there and it is right in the way. So let me go move that and then we'll get started. Okay, let's try this again. The winds have mostly been calm, but it's actually just now picking up. I have to keep an eye on that. Planning to take all the time I need today. It's just so hot. If I get in a rush, things will, things will go bad quickly, I think. So we're gonna start out with, oh, I need to shoot some ciders or some fouling shots. Uh, yep, it left the bullet in the rifle. So unless I can Turn it like this and get it to fall, which I can't. All right, I gotta go get a cleaning rod. Boy, this range trip's off to a fun start. Okay, so that was a complete and total nightmare. I got a cleaning rod and got the bullet out of the barrel. There was powder all over the place, of course. So I tried to clean all of that out, went, uh, used some Q-tips to clean out the area around the lugs and the chamber, and I could not get the bolt to close. So to make a long story short, I ended up having to get some compressed air and blow out that entire area to get the bolt to run again. And I still can't believe how much it felt like metal on metal. Like I was trying to close the bolt and it was just stopping dead, but it was powder. So I'm back out here, we're ready to go. I did just fire two shots just to, to foul up the barrel a little bit and we're ready to get started with our regular, with our regular groups. So we're starting with the full length die. This, is, this will be the four shot group. So much for 15 thousandths of jump, I guess, right? This, this 2.3 inch overall length is ridiculous anyway. Like we already saw earlier, there's so little contact between the neck and the bearing surface that it's not a big surprise. So let's get to shooting. Okay, so that's not a bad group. 0.59 inches, velocity was 35.34, standard deviation was 8.3. That velocity is 50 feet per second faster than we saw in the last video. That's interesting. Okay, next is that same load, 24.5 grains, and this time it's with the, with the neck sizing die. So that group was a little bit better, 0.47 inches. Velocity was 35.27, standard deviation 17.0, extreme spread 45. Okay, so we didn't quite match the 0.42 inch group we shot in the last video, but that's pretty close. I want to take a little break, make sure our barrel stays nice and cool. Okay, so I'm ready to move on and we're jumping up to 25.2 grains of N133 here. So I want to be watching out for a crazy velocity spike or any pressure signs on the brass. If I can remember, I'm gonna try and switch the order I shoot these. So I wanna start with the next size brass, which will be the right hand dot. 
and then we'll do the full length. Okay, that velocity was 36.11. The brass looks good. Okay, so that was a 0.53 inch group, velocity 36.10, standard deviation 12.1. Similar performance to what we've seen with everything else so far. That's good, consistency's good. Okay, next is the same load with the full length sizing die. Okay, so the group's pretty much the same as the others, 0.47 inches, velocity was 36.22, standard deviation jumped all the way up to 41.3 with an extreme spread of 101. It's a very consistent performance. Okay, another quick break, and then we'll move on. Okay, so it's time to move on, going to 25.4 grains. I'm going to shoot these in the normal order with the full length die first. Well, that group certainly opened up a little bit, 0.81 inches, average velocity 36.54, standard deviation 17.1. Okay, next is the next sizing die with that same charge, 25.4 grains. All right, I like this one. 0.38 inches, best group of the day by quite a bit. Velocity was 36.44. Standard deviation was down to 4.7 with an extreme spread of 12. That's just good stuff. Okay, next up is 25.6, and we're gonna do the same thing as earlier where I shoot the, the next size brass first. So this is 25.6 grains. Well, that's a bit crappier than I was hoping for. That's a 0.94 inch group, velocity 3676, standard deviation 16.2. Okay, same load, 25.6, this time full length size brass. All right, three shot group. You know what, due to the heat of the day and everything, I think we should stop at three shots here on this group. 0 0.09 inches so far. Let's see how bad we can screw it up. See, I told you we should have stopped. Ended up with a 0.45 inch group. Average velocity was 36.88. Standard deviation was 21.0. I'm kind of glad the way these velocities are ending up 
our last charge of 25.8 is probably going to be right about 3,700 feet per second, which looking at the manuals in the data, that seems, it seems reasonable. It seems about right and is about as far as I would want to go with this combination. All right, I'm going to take a break for just a second. Okay, so we got two more groups to go. Our last charge is 25.8 grains of N133. So I've got one dot left on the top row and one dot left on the bottom. So I had to kind of zoom out a little bit. Sorry if the target camera kind of sucks, but there's always shot marker. So we're going to start with the full length die. I said 25.8 grains. Brass looks good. That first velocity was 36.74. Okay, so that's a 0.83 inch group. Velocity was 36.84. Standard deviation 9.2. Okay, last five shots. That same load, 25.8, this time with the neck sizing die. Okay, so that was a 0.71 inch group, velocity 36.86, standard deviation 10.3. So that's not too bad, pretty good looking target. 0.83 inches was our biggest group, and 0.38 inches was our smallest. All right, let me get packed up, let's get back to the bench. We'll figure all this out. So I don't have any pressure signs on brass or anything to show you. It all looks the same and it all looks good. But I do want to check and see if everything's, you know, fully fire formed now. You remember our 1.466 number from earlier in the video? Let's go ahead and zero this one. So the first one I picked up looks good. So I'm gonna take a couple minutes and spot check around, see if I can find any that aren't. The vast majority are right on the number. I have found a couple that are a thousandth, that were a thousandth short. I think this one here was one of them. About, about a thousand short, but none of those crazy ones that are way short. So first of all, on our die shootout, the average group size with the full length sizing die was 0.63 inches. The average group with the neck sizing die was 0.61 inches. So this proves that neck sizing is better than full length resizing. So if you're out there trying to shoot good groups and you're using a full length sizing die, you are cringe. You're using a garbage product and you should immediately switch to a neck sizing die. If you have to size the body of your case, it should only be done with a, with a body die or maybe a full length bushing type die with the bushing removed. But that's really only if you're desperate. It's best to just stick with neck sizing only and just get a bigger bolt handle. Now I'm joking, of course, we saw, you know, nothing. Kind of like I mentioned in the beginning, I didn't expect much and we didn't get much. We shot two crappy groups with each type of die and we shot three good groups with each die. They both performed fine and we didn't really learn much. Except, I mean, I gained a lot of knowledge and confidence in using the Lee Collet die, so that's definitely worth something. I think it would be interesting to do another test like this when we're using a bullet or a seating depth where we've actually got proper contact between our neck and the bearing surface. So maybe we'll try it with another bullet at some point. So the, the standard deviation numbers were pretty good today. We had a couple, we had one that was 41.3 and one that was 21.0, but most were in the teens and we had a couple single digit numbers. So that was good to see. But I have, I've ordered a firing pin spring for this gun. I've actually ordered several firing pin springs. I need to, I wanna change it in this gun. I wanna change it in the 243 ADL that you guys have already seen. And I might have a couple other Remington 700s coming up that I'm gonna do videos on that are probably gonna need springs as well. This goes back to that 243 video, bolt action reloading and several others had mentioned that that firing pin spring can cause inconsistent ignition. I'm not sure I've fully got my head wrapped around how it can really cause poor SDs, but we've, I've got multiple guns to test it in. And you know, 
you know, that was a big thing in those, in those 243 videos I made with that gun, the SDs were awful. And then with this gun, you know, so far, like the numbers we saw today with, with Invitivory N133 are far better than we've seen with anything else. And they've been really, really terrible with a lot of powders. So we'll swap the spring and see if it makes a difference. I, I do have, I've got an old uh, bolt disassembly tool that my grandfather had. So hopefully I've got the stuff that I need to do it. I know there's, I know it's a tricky, tricky process. So I'll have to do a little bit of research. Another thing that folks had mentioned in the last video was that it looks like the front scope base on this gun is jacked up. And I promise it's not. It's, it's got some shim stock or something between the tube and the scope mount. It, or it looks like it might be masking tape or something. And on camera, it looks, it looks like something crazy is going on. I promise it's not, it's fine. If the gun wasn't shooting so good, I might do something about it, but I don't want to touch anything. But I appreciate you guys noticing that and mentioning it, because I'll agree, like on video, it looks weird. It looks super weird. So the main takeaway from this video for me is about that incompletely fire formed brass that we had after the last video. I just never dreamed that those charges of N133 wouldn't be enough to completely fire form new brass. And every time I, every time I run into something like this, I always think back to the 500 questions I've had over the years, you know, with people talking about, they just can't get consistent numbers with their comparator or things just seem weird. And if one of them had told me like, yeah, I was shooting these loads, it would never, it would never even occur to me to think like, yeah, bro, that's just, that's not hot enough to fire for them completely. You know what I'm saying? Like this, this is kind of blowing my mind a little bit and it's, it's making me want to retest this with something I'm a little bit more familiar with, like uh, a 55 grain full metal jacket with CFE 223. A 55 grainer is a pretty light bullet for CFE 223, kind of a similar relationship to the bullet that we see you know, today with Vitivory N133 and the 40. I don't know that it would make a, an interesting video in and of itself, especially if I didn't find anything, but I might load up a few shots and see what's going on. And if, if the results are surprising, maybe I'll do a bigger test. In that situation, CFE 223 with a 55 grainer, what's the minimum charge you need to use to get your brass fully fire formed? I don't know. And today's situation makes me want to find out. And like I mentioned, it's, it's, not, it's not some alien concept. We deal with it all of the time, especially, like you, you go watch my Mosin Nagant videos where we're loading 762x54R. And I'm almost always loading light loads, you know, light recoil, long brass life, easy on the old gun. And in those scenarios, a lot of times you're, you'll end up with gas leakage, you know, smoke and carbon and crap migrating down the body of your case. So, you know, kind of a similar concept, right? It just didn't seal, that load didn't have enough pressure to seal it to the chamber. So we either need to shoot hotter charges or go to a faster powder. I guess my thought is that if this is a phenomenon that you can commonly track, then it could be used as a pressure sign especially in situations where you're, you're making up your own load, load data or you don't really have a lot of confidence in the loads you've chosen. It could be something worthwhile to track at the bench to get an idea of how you're doing on pressure, I guess, is what I'm, I don't, I don't really have any properly formed thoughts on this right now, folks. It's just kinda, it's shown up unexpectedly. I'll dream up a test or two, we'll figure something out. But for now, I think that's it. Appreciate you guys joining me. Four groups under a half inch today. It's a pretty good day on the range. So, all right, I'll see you guys next time.